To whom much is given, much is required. Part of that requirement is sharing. Culture is the heartbeat within our lives, and it's at the core of so many things. While we live in a time when we are starving for wisdom, I welcome you to your wisdom retreat at Culture Raises Us. Yes, yes, welcome. Well, today's guest, um, I've had the pleasure of working with at Nike for a minute, but uh, we really built our relationship, I guess, by, by just having some real conversations um, in the building over the years. So Kevin Bethune is the founder and chief creative officer of Dreams, Design, and Life, which is an amazing think tank that delivers design and innovation services using a human-centered approach. Um, and, and I'm going to let him provide color to this and himself um, in a little bit after we kind of set the tone for the show as we normally do um, with our signature question. So, Kevin, when you hear culture, what does that mean to you? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Esther, for having me on this platform. I love what you're doing. Had a chance to watch a couple episodes, so uh, truly impactful. Uh, the word culture, of course, of course. So the word culture, honestly, this notion of tapestry comes to mind. I could use that for you imagine. Mm. Weaves, knits, knots even. But I, I, it makes me think about all these threads that go back as far as history, like deep history, if, we, if you think about historical relevance and the threads of accomplishments, as well as some of the threads of uh, systemic inequity that we're still wrestling with. I think those threads also lead us to the present moment of where we're at right now mm. and how do we show up in, in moments together. And then it also makes me think about how those, uh, how those threads extend into the future and how we might speculate what is possible. Like mm. I think we live in a world where we're sort of navigating infrastructure and environments that tell us how it should be. Mm. But I'm all, also like thinking a lot about like how does black genius show up and, and actually illuminate what could be, what could be possible for us in our culture. And so all these threads are commingled, they intersect, they intersect with other cultures, of course, but it's that communication, it's that collaboration, it's that community building, it's that creativity, which you know I'm definitely keen on in terms Absolutely. of like how how does our culture show up in terms of the the left the left brain and right brain sort of you know opportunities that we have, uh, and then again how do how do we speculate what's possible for us in the future? Yeah, that that tapestry um, label that you put out there that that hits really deep, right? And and I and I love the dimensions that you provided on, you know, your definition when you think of culture. So for those of you who are not, you know, so familiar, I, I would love for you to give um, a breakdown a little bit of yourself, Kev. No, I appreciate that. Um, the way I describe myself lately is I am a designer, first and foremost, that's my tip of the spear. I, I found design sort of mid-career, and mm -hmm. I'm very thankful for the timing, just the way the world has sort of opened up. And that's right. Merged. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur, and recently I've found this new path of, of writing books, which I'm very thankful for and what that's opening up. So designer, entrepreneur, author, and I presently lead uh, Dreams Design and Life as its founder and chief creative, uh, but very much our mission is to unlock human potential and, mm -hmm. and really go after opportunities where we can create holistic and empathic solutions that actually show up for people when they need us the most. Mm. You know, I always say there's really no reference for what's never been done before, right? And <clears throat> as a cultivator, which are the individuals like yourself that we bring on, many times it requires you to plant, you know, these seeds that you really have a vision for, but but you're not really sure how they're going to blossom, right? Mm. And I want to know what were the key moments that led you to where you are currently with this sudden awakening, right, to this role that design plays in transforming society. Like, what was that? Hmm. Honestly, it was a slow build of chapters where when I reflect back, it's easy to say this now that now that we're here in this moment. Right, right. Um, <laughs> but when I started my career, I didn't know much about creativity and what that would mean for me hmm. other, than it, other than it being in the realm of hobby. I, I drew for hobby throughout my youth. That was my, like, itch to scratch. 
but translating that into a formal career path, I, I couldn't see it. And it, no, nor was it celebrated in, um, you know, where I was sort of raised, where I grew up. Um, it, it was like, you know, coming up in a middle class home, like there had better been a pragmatic job waiting for the, the other side of an investment in education, for example. And so mm -hmm. design, innovation, those were abstract terms under the guise of art back then. For better or for worse, that was sort of the mindset. So uh, because interests intersected with um, science and mathematics as well and drawing, engineering made more pragmatic sense. So I started my career in, in nuclear power <laughs> of all mm -hmm. places. Jeez. Um, I promise if we were in person, I wouldn't be radioactive. I promise. <laughs> so, uh, but that, that's where I cut my teeth on product in that, in mm. that environment. Very mission critical mm. opportunity costs on the, on the order of millions of dollars a day that a plant is not up and running at power. So, you know, when you're coming into a maintenance event for a nuclear plant, it's very mission critical. Right. Um, and rightfully so in terms of the Absolutely. applications. <laughs> Absolutely. Slight, just slight ones. <laughs> But a very humbling experience, which I'm very thankful for. It gave me a strong foundation of how things work, how to build product, how to work with high-performing teams to get stuff done. Uh, fast forward, uh, after a business education on top of the tech background, I come into Nike in a conventional manner. I started as mm -hmm. a business planner in the Nike environment. Um, and that was great in that it solidified the business acumen that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't looking to change careers completely away from product or engineering. Mm. But but going through the paces, um, you know, I, I added value as a business planner, but folks wanted to map me to a finance trajectory. Mm. And folks meanwhile... wanted to map you. Please listen to the words. Folks wanted to map you. Please continue. <laughs> yeah, they, they had sort of, uh, you know, career paths sort of laid out for me. Uh, but meanwhile, I'm networking, trying to figure out, like, where is the product? Where is the creativity? And mm -hmm. meanwhile, I'm, I'm meeting newfound creative professionals and newfound creative friends for the first time in my career. And I'm saying, what are you you're doing that stuff? How can mm -hmm. I connect myself to what you're doing and how can I learn from you? And, and so the networking chats, as you know, Nike being the collegial environment that it was one people kick you to two people, kick you to four people in the team. That's right. But then through those coffee chats, you start to see opportunities to actually stretch yourself and show like what you can deliver, what you can contribute to teams that don't know where you're coming from. And so I took advantage of some of those stretch assignment opportunities, folks like uh, Jason Maiden, Dwayne Edwards. Um, and I think that's where we met when I was give, I was doing a stretch assignment for the Jordan brand. That's right. Showing up, showing up in the early mornings with Dwayne, commiserating on briefs that he didn't have enough designers for. And I learned, you know, and got a couple of models out under his mentorship but just learned what product creation meant in the Nike environment by doing and not just mm -hmm. sort of as observing. Um, and that allowed me to get closer into the product engine. I eventually joined Global Footwear uh, as a sort of a, a process manager, but I was designing shoes on the side of that day job. Right. And I was, right. I was also uh, finding open doors to contribute in the innovation kitchen and other Nike categories. But I, 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 I did, I didn't know it at the time, but I was reaching a fork in the road um, where I was very thankful to the Nike avenues to cut my teeth on product in that environment, in that context. But I'm also watching the world outside of Nike converging as well. I'm, I'm seeing design celebrated on the cover of business magazines. I'm, I'm looking at business schools embracing design thinking and having design mm -hmm. courses in their programs. And I saw a little bit of myself in this growing convergence that I was noticing in the marketplace. Mm. Meanwhile, meanwhile, this is the advent of the iPod and the advent of Apple with their ecosystem around iTunes, hardware, software, these growing ecologies that converge all these disciplines together. I'm like, I, I really need to situate myself in that intersection with sort of the brewing mm. vision. But I had to be honest about how short my creative leg of the stool was compared to my engineering background and compared to my business. Right, background. right, right. So, so I had a fork in the road, meaning that I could, I could have continued to claw and scratch in the Nike environment another 10 to 15 years before someone might pedigree me as, okay, now you can be a formalized. Now, now you're designer. good enough to move on. You're, you're good enough to move on now. Exactly. Or I could go and invest in my creative foundation more concertedly through additional education. 
And so I chose that route. I chose to leave my Nike job after working, gosh, 10 years within the five years I was there because I was working double duty on stretch assignments the whole that's time. Right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so I decided to accelerate by getting two more years of grad school under my belt to really solidify the positioning that I wanted. Mm. That, and the again, the wording, the position that you wanted. Oof. Rough. Because honestly, I'll be honest and say that there were, there's a lot of emotional ups and downs to that journey because, you know, you're trying to put a double duty to learn and try to show and hold up evidence of what you could potentially do so that you can be mapped differently. That's right. And some of those conversations were, you know, motivating as well as discouraging, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. And, you should be. And I, and I think learning how to grapple with that too and, and uh, reflecting on times when I probably wasn't feeling comfortable in my own skin because I'm at this weird precipice between mm. two disciplines, you know what I mean? And not finding uh, a ground to stand on yet and going through that adversity of, of inner sort of thought process. And is this mm. me or is it not? A lot of wrestling match matches, even in my own head. <laughs> oh, no, I, 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 can, I can just imagine. I, I was about to jump in. I was going to wait because <laughs> I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm listening to your story and even learning some more about you already. Um, and I'm so glad that you're sharing these components of one being in a situation that seemingly, you know, from the outside is like, how could you ever leave? What do you mean after five, 10 years and you're choosing, you made a choice um, that was essentially to bet on yourself and your instinct, your instinct of knowing that there was something bigger there was something more um, that was available to you and for you. You know, I always say, you know, life is really 10% of what happens to you, but really 90% of how you respond mm. is what I think life is is really built out of. And it, it sounds like you, you've you taken full advantage of the 90% of how you've chosen to respond and grow. Well, I appreciate that. Honestly, it took a village in terms of, there were a lot of that too. things happening at that same time. Yeah. Um, I looked at my my father, my elder, my first mentor in life, and how he perhaps was treated navigating corporate America and facing racism, ageism, and, and feeling discarded after being so loyal to the things mm -hmm. that he was working on. I had that in my the back of my mind. And when folks tried to perhaps map me to what they wanted me to do out of convenience, Versus mm. trying to foster evidence and convictions around what I'm meant to do. And then my son is just born around that time. <laughs> and then you've got to set an example. You've got to set. His birth was the catalyst. Okay, it's mm. time to go. It's time to go, go get this done. Which that for many people would have been the opposite. It would have been, let me stay in this place of comfort, safety net, whatever. Just had a kid. I can't go out on my own i can't go back to school to learn something that is a deep passion burning inside actually yeah you can yeah you can and i'm so glad you utilize that catalyst for the other way mm. of choosing to oh no this is a confirmation and affirmation that i need to step off the boat so that i could walk on the water indeed indeed so we packed up the home put half of it in storage in it the other half we found a tiny apartment in pasadena and I, I went through two more years of, of deep grad schooling at Art Center College of Design, studying a master's of science in industrial design. And Art Center was a place, a magical place. Um, it was a world-class design institution, but historically you had to come from design to be a part of a graduate program there. Hmm. But Art Center's aperture opened, much like these other graduate schools that I mentioned, they opened the aperture to, impre to appreciate multidisciplinary uh, folks coming in to open nice. everyone's sort of aperture. Nice. Um, so meanwhile, like I, I'm in a cohort for the first time where I'm I'm studying next to a former marketing director from Coca-Cola who's mm. coming for the same reasons I was coming into the program. Floor. Look at that. You're not alone. <laughs> exactly. Or another brother who was navigating a couple of years deep into his Harvard med school journey and decides, you know what? I don't want to become a surgeon anymore based on what I've seen. I want to impact the medical arena through design. So he stopped his med school progression and pivoted wow. to embrace design. So this was the cohort of 14 of us. And 
Yeah, yeah. Half half the education was the industrial design practicum of how do you execute great design, but the other half was coaching us how to team and how to show up to pitch venture opportunities. So they were trying to breed graduates that were designers as entrepreneurs, designers as change agents, not just designers to execute an aesthetic objective. That's right. That's right. Which I think is a great segue on asking you, so how do you define human-centered design? And why don't you think this is something more widely discussed or, or taught within corporate America? Well, it's a long conversation, but I think my short answer for what human-centered design is, and I'll use the synonym design thinking at times, but okay. for, for me, it's merely a philosophy that anyone that's curious about about how we show up for people, how do we serve people, and really elevating the the human imperatives that are at play for any solution that we're working on, we can all share in that philosophy. We can all participate in a creative journey and and allow business folks into that, technologists into that, so that we can actually ideate together. We can go discover together, find out where the needs are in the marketplace, and we can ideate together to derive solutions. But to the business community at large, regardless of discipline, it still sounds too theoretical when I say that or when we describe that process. Mm. There haven't been enough, perhaps, proof points. And it takes bold, visionary leadership to embrace some of the practices. And there's a big difference between sharing a philosophy that we can all sort of nod our heads and agree, yeah, we want to do that. But actually wiring an organization to appreciate that philosophy and then start to like wire the actual capabilities. That's mm -hmm. a whole other conversation that for the most part isn't happening to the level that's making design thinking and practice actually be efficient or actually be impactful. There's too much, mm -hmm. there's, there's a glass ceiling of ambiguity is the best way I can describe it. And mm. you know, my, my recent purpose I feel is helping folks crack through that glass ceiling and understand how do you actually wire true design and innovation capabilities in your organization so that we can better share this philosophy together. So, so, so where are the case studies? Where are the examples? How do we show that this is a bold, efficient new way of thinking and operating? I think no matter how many case studies we hold up, and they're out there, there's organizations like I could think of, uh, my friend Myra Percini is the chief design officer at PepsiCo, who's driven a lot of this incredible design thinking initiatives across the PepsiCo portfolio. There's, there's, there are case studies out there, but again, for the business community at large, it's still in the, the very edge case that you can actually see the evidence, but across mm. the board, I think design historically has had this unfortunate perception and precedent of being the very last step in any value chain. It's the okay, all the big thinking was done by other disciplines. Okay, now it's time for design to actually add the, add the aesthetic layer or skin mm -hmm. the, the app or the website. Mm -hmm. or draw the pretty pictures of what the product might be, but we already thought about what it should do. And what I'm saying is, let's recognize the precedent, how new design is at the strategy table, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and there's still a lot that, that needs to be done to really invest in the capability and allow it to have a runway to actually grow and blossom. Right. And so, so is, is money a factor here? Because obviously money is an important factor that motivates the work, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you balance the need to kind of generate revenue with the reality that a lot of what you're trying to do is about creating systematic change, right? Like, is it, cause I think within this, you're kind of trying to deprioritize profits for more important causes and things to that degree as well. Right. Or no. No, it, it does play in, right? I'm, I'm not definitely not a, a person that's against capitalism. I do. Right. We, we arrive at respectful, sustainable capitalism. Right, right. right. Um, but unfortunately, I think the world is in this sort of flywheel where it's like, and no disrespect to any disciplines when I say this, it's like a lot of marketers marketing, consumers consuming. And mm -hmm. if anything, digital is speeding up that, that sort of infinity, infinity loop of flywheel behavior. It's like getting faster and faster. Um, and sometimes I think 
I think more so about value criteria than I think about the money itself. Because our mm. case for money is only speeding that flywheel engine up of marketers, marketing, consumers, consuming. We're not thinking about culture when we do that. We're not thinking about ethics when we do that. We're not thinking about the environment. And clearly we can look all around and see all these. That's issues. right. That's right. What I what I coach, you know, my client partners, the businesses that I engage, is we have to elevate like who's the full constellation of stakeholder in any situation that we're designing for, right? Uh, who's the end consumer? Who's who's the stakeholders around that person? Uh, who's exchanging value and information with each other? What is that constellation of people? And let's really work hard to elevate the value criteria of what each of those people care about in the system. And oh, by mm. the way, the planet, the planet is a stakeholder too, with a value criteria as well. So we need to elevate this constellation of values. And we could then, then we can have a respectful conversation about the flow of money the flow of information, the flow of data, and where is it respectful? Where is it extractive or exploitive? Because unfortunately, um, even for organizations that embrace design thinking, the money priority has them a little bit out of pocket. Well, yep. they'll, claim, they'll claim to have the world's best design studio or innovation studio aiming to get after their consumer, but they're designing for that consumer. Mm. from an ivory tower or from a, a very extractive engine claiming to design for someone, claiming to serve someone. Meanwhile, you look at the practices and you're like, okay, you're not even designing with those folks. You're not even respecting them. How about that? Collaborate. You're, 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 hitting, you're hitting something here that's very deep. You're going deep. You're going deep. Please continue. <laughs> so it's like, instead of studying our consumer buying a mirrored glass with a clipboard and treating them like lab rats, are we actually investing in the right techniques to show up for people mm. with people at their level on their turf in their language and in their context with mm. full, full humility to drop our lab coats and just be real with people as mm. a designer, as I step into the field, I'm going to basically tell you what project I'm working on and with full humility, I don't know everything. And you probably have a lot of answers and can we incentivize each other to help each other? built mm -hmm. like that should be the conversation not this weird design for ivory tower positioning where i'm primed to exploit you even if i'm well-intentioned the way i'm going about it i'm going to exploit it's very exploitive it's very exploitive yeah. and i would say design with is not enough even i'm looking yeah. at a lot of these world world-class design studios and ivory towers and innovation teams i'm looking at them and I look at the beautiful mosaic that is the world. Talked about tapestry earlier, the beautiful tapestry, if you want to use that analogy. Mm -hmm. Back at those teams, those teams don't represent the tapestry or the mosaic of the world. Mm. Mm. So why don't you have people in your teams that look like the world or are representative members of the world with deep relationships that can help authentically bridge you to those communities, our culture? Mm-hmm. We, if we take the black community, it's appalling when I look within these world-class professed environments, these studio environments, and I don't see ourselves represented. It's appalling when they might be designing for a city that has a population that's half black people. Right. Like and not even 10% of black people in the room making the decisions. Goodness. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll shut up, sorry, is that- No, there's no shutting up. That's what, this is why you're here. Appreciate you, bro. Um, a lot of the things that I, I point out for teams uh, when I'm part of teams and I see sort of teaming in action is when I observe people problem solving together, brainstorming together, going through agendas, speed, unfortunately, thanks to digital, thanks to the chase of money, speed is often a, uh, speed is often an implied authority in the room. Mm -hmm. and people can't can't see that it's there. Mm -hmm. So you might be like one of us in the room and you have a concern, but at times you, it, there, it might not be the most welcoming environment to raise your hand and say, you know what, I actually have a concern here about the ethical boundary that we're crossing or the extreme mm -hmm. position that we're taking. And if anything, we have to slow the clock at times. Absolutely. To allow, to allow ourselves to go faster later. 
Yeah, I, you know, because with, with speed, not all the time, but often enough, you find that you put yourself into a state of rush and compromise. Yeah. Um, right? And so there has to be a, a step back, take a minute, respectfully, to identify and approach things as opposed to just, we need to get it done, get it done, get it done. So I'm so glad you said that. And you talked about some of these problems, right, or things that we're trying to solve. Do you? What are some of the biggest problems that you see in society that you believe designers, such as yourself, still need to find, you know, solutions for? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of conversation right now. If we check our Twitter feeds, our social media feeds, on all things AI, whether mm. it's Chat GBT or Midjourney, which is one of the visualization tools. Um, there's a lot of conversations of, is AI, is AI gonna replace jobs? What does this mean for the creative professions? Um, and if anything, also it's indicative of how the, the speed of the clock is only gonna get faster with That's right. these technologies being put into place. But to me, they're still just mediums, just like That's right. pixels are a medium for the next app I might create. Um, you know, physical molecules are the medium for any industrial design that I want to achieve. AI algorithms and the like are just mediums to, mm -hmm. to you know, play with and figure out how, how can we better show up for people on their terms and in their context. As compliments, um, not supplements. As compliments. I, I, I do think there's a tremendous opportunity for augmentation, but we still have to sort of steer. And design... As these, as these platforms have more proliferation and more prowess, design needs to be there at the very beginning to design some of the, the human-centered guiding principles or guide rails or boundary conditions to allow those algorithms to actually function successfully. Design needs to be designing that stuff, that, that plumbing, if you will, from the very beginning alongside the engineer that's building these technologies. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, already about seven times, you done gone over my head and I'm still trying to figure it out. But I, And I just will say right now, thank God that you tapped into the purpose that he instilled in you um, in terms of doing this type of work. Because I think it's so easy for us to just go, I don't want to say go with the flow, but go with the programming in which has been put in place for us. And you have gone for lack of a better term, against that programming and tapping into what has been instilled in your spirit as one of the things you are to do. And, I, and I'm so grateful that you listened to that in your spirit and in your mind, because you, you're touching on thing that, things that are going to open up so many more doors for, for many to even think of and view, right? As you were just talking about AI, as you mentioned before, that is a hot topic for many. And I'm not even going to lie to you. There was a point where I was like, so is this going to replace people? I mean, I, I think I even went in and I had AI do, you know, what does culture mean to you? And it, 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 AI came back with a breakdown that was like, I was like, oh, let, let me grab a couple of these notes. Let me, like, AI, you really done, you, you hit it. <laughs> I mean, it, it was crazy. But to your point, these are mediums that are used to complement. Like, they're never going to replace. You can't replace a human, you, you, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're not replaceable. Even like when people say, you know, when you leave a job, they can replace you. Uh, they can get another body in that seat, but they can never replace Kevin. They can never replace Aster. They can never replace, right? But they could put another body in that. And so you, you've, you've just put a little bit more ease to me in just which you, the way you broke down AI. No, which is, which is serious. And I think you were talking about, you know, leaders as well a little while ago. And I would love to hear from you, what traits do you believe make up this visionary leader? Because you're talking about visionary leaders being able to embrace this thinking that you are really driving. Um, so I would love to hear what you feel the makeup is for a visionary leader and what steps does it require to bring a vision to life with that visionary leader? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I'll say that visionary leadership, like if I break down those words, I'll start with leadership. And again, I'll reference my father, my first mentor. And, you know, getting the chance to you know, follow him to work, <laughs> bring kids at work kind of day, you, you, you sort of notice, you, you watch your family. 
and you see how people lean into his his perspective, his instruction with with tremendous respect. And he mm. would tell me, this is a privilege. Like you can't lead anyone unless you have trust first. Mm -hmm. Watching him as a leader, he'd roll up his sleeves, put, you know, he, he might have been in management or executive leadership, and he's he's putting up things, bringing out hammers and working alongside his people to show them the way to, to contribute, to roll up the sleeves with them. He was serving them. That's that's what I drew from watching my father. He, he was service oriented. So the mm -hmm. trust was established based on the service so that when it came time for him to lead them and articulate what the vision was, they would follow with no question. So you can't lead anyone without trust. So that, I mean, that's the first exemplar always for me. Yep. Um, the second was a, a wonderful woman by the name of Patty Ross, who you may know and then uh, from the Nike environment. Um, for some of Nike's most gnarly business and infrastructural challenges, I think the C-level folks would point to Patty. Patty can come in and do it. She can figure it out. She can untangle the knot and get people uh, to get people to fully embrace the change that was required in those moments. Patty had like a string of these home run wins of just being able to transform things to move people. Mm. And no matter how, no matter how like new and novel or exciting a visionary idea was to Patty, she kind of look at it and say, uh, that feels like an IT project. <laughs> how are you going to bring people along? How are you going to demonstrate what's in it for them? And how could it, how could you actually co-create through piloting and things to breed the evidence where people want to lean in and see the evidence and be a part of it and be a part of shaping what that vision is ultimately mm -hmm. of what we're trying to achieve. Let's not just go chase a theory. Let's, let's put it into practice by early mm -hmm. wins that lead to bigger wins. So she was a huge exemplar for me around like what it means to constitute transformation and change. And I've carried her lessons from being under her mentorship. I've carried her lessons through every piece of my career since knowing her. And then, and then the last person I'll mention is um, sometimes it pays to look at role models that are modeling what you aspire to be or what you aspire That's right. to do. That's right. And, and there's been a, um, a person that I was watching even when I was a Nike employee, but he was outside of Nike. And it's uh, a man by the name of Dr. John Maida. So mm. John, in my opinion, was the consummate polymath professional and that he was a computer scientist. I mean, MIT born. He was a digital artist. He was one of the first to just blow out these beautiful comp computational derived artworks that have been sort of showcased at the MoMA and Kupi Hewitt and these, these world renowned museums. His artwork has arrived at that level. He became uh, a president of a design school, Rhode Island School of Design. Hmm. Um, he, um, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, RISD, uh, Berlin School of D Design, sorry, messing the name up. Uh, he uh, was one of the first design partners in Silicon Valley. Right. right? Uh, coming into that VC world as a designer, he, he showed what was possible there. Um, he joined um, Automatic, he joined uh, uh, Everbridge, like, and now he's at Microsoft leading the charge with design and artificial intelligence. And so he's done a number of things in his career, accomplished every degree under the sun imaginable to show how these intersections can pr provoke valuable opportunities for better solutioning. So. Mm. so to that question then, there's this new generation then of leaders that are in the making and are on their way to take these more senior positions at these companies. What seeds would you plant within their minds, given the thinking that you're all about? You know, I think for when I look at and, and have an opportunity to engage young folks uh, thinking about their career, I, I do believe the future is going to be even more multidisciplinary. They're going to find themselves in more and more yeah. rooms with radically different people. Yep. And not having that be the exception, it's going to be more so the norm. I, I honestly believe that. Because that future collaboration is the currency that's going to inform future innovation. So, mm -hmm. in order to function, I'm not I'm not going to tell a young person that they have to do the things that I exactly did. And you know, I'm, I'm sitting here with a very polymathic, hybrid background. 
Maybe right. that's not right for this person that I'm talking to. Maybe they want to be the, the uber specialist of one thing and do it really well. But I think no matter if you're a hybrid or you're a generalist or you're that singular expert, we're, we're going to have to navigate arenas where we'll have to exercise our breadth and depth of contribution. And for me, like breadth is like, how do we, because we're going to be in rooms more and more with different people, how do we communicate right. uniquely? How do we collaborate uniquely? How do we get on the same page around imperatives that matter? Yeah, and then there's yeah. The piece. That's yeah, you're and so as you, as you talk, no, no, please, as you were talking, I was like, yeah, being in these rooms is significant. So I, I look at, and having a voice in these rooms, as you just said. Yeah. So yes. I look at the consequences then for like up and coming black designers and innovators who are not taking the stance and pushing for their voices to be heard in rooms that they're in. How do we unlock that? I think we have to recognize that the world is the way it is by design. That it was informed by someone, no matter the enterprise, institution, infrastructure that we navigate, it is the way it is by some design. And as I mentioned, um, the, the, the pedagogies of how we've been groomed to navigate our professional journeys, the pedagogies have been inspired and informed by a very few select sets of people mm -hmm. with, with deep power and privilege to be able to have that license to shape the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. but, but look around us. We talked about all the, the problems that we can see to the left and right of us. Those those problems, as well as the mismatches of having teams not be able to design for and be relevant to the demographics they claim to serve, there's mismatches all over the place. Like mm -hmm. rare, do, rare do companies speak to women correctly or non-binary populations correctly or a black community, which we know correctly. There's mismatches mm -hmm. everywhere and the speed of the clock is only increasing. So it's imperative for us, like the world has these huge gaps that are waiting mm -hmm. for us as black professionals to, to help solve. So, you know, we, it's imperative that we follow our convictions and speak up because that's right. If we don't, no one else will. I, I tell people, you know, if you're not being your unapologetic self in these rooms and providing the POV, not only are you doing yourself a disservice, but you're doing everybody in that room a disservice and everybody outside of the room that this is going to touch. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the room, and it's not speaking for speaking purposes, you're in there because you have an expertise and a POV that's needed that yes, is going to be different from that of the majority of the room, and that's okay. Different okay. doesn't mean wrong. Different does not mean wrong. It means let's have a conversation and have it add dimension to what we're doing to help get us to a better place, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I'm so glad that that you touted that as well of it, it is your duty to speak and have a point of view in these rooms because we've seen, and I say this often, as a society, we've been mediocre at best. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. At best. And it's because we haven't unlocked the greatness in all of us to contribute to what this thing is. And, you know, with that, I, I, I wanna get your POV. What's the biggest white space for growth um, and advancement within design cultures as we know it today? Because I feel like we're kind of hitting on it right now, but maybe there's something else that you feel is a, a big white space that you, you might even have been thinking about or trying to, to figure out how we get after it. Um. If anything, I'm very passionate about how do we break out of this trap, this this flywheel, this infinity loop that I mentioned of marketers marketing, consumers consuming, and mm -hmm. the, not not really recognizing the extraction. Um, we talk right now in the form of OKRs, KPIs, clicks, likes, follows, but we're not having enough conversations across the business world around like how do we actually show up meaningfully for the stakeholders that we claim to serve. Like mm. meaningfully, meaningfully, respectfully, um, appreciating the full constellation, um, and leveraging all the ingredients that are at our disposal, whether it's physical, digital services, algorithms. I don't care that all these all these ingredients are there for us. 
But unfortunately, mm-hmm. we're in systems where we're routed and we're constrained to this one train of thought or one way of problem solving. Mm-hmm. If we get back to the, the conversation around the tapestry that we talked about earlier. There's, and if we span many cultures across the globe, there are many ways of knowing that are not mm-hmm. even part of the conversations that, that are informing the next generation of platforms and solutions that we're going to use one day. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's a, just a tremendous opportunity to say, like, how do we get out of some of these exploitive and extractive traps and start to figure out holistic ways of showing up for people when and where they need us the most and in their context? And if we do that, the business concern will take care of itself. Yeah, and I love how you just brought that all home together. And I, I would ask, as you're going through this and these conversations and these thought processes and looking at and identifying these opportunities, is there an intentional choice you make to ensure that you don't deviate from your why? Mm. I I think about breadth and depth all the time. I kind of go back to that because it's like, mm-hmm. you know, I I have gotten comfortable saying no to a lot of business opportunities that I could you know, easily chase if it was, if, if I was only about like pursuing the money, mm. if I was only about, uh, you know, feeding the the team and, and just blindly moving forward just to grow the business. But I think there's a huge opportunity for all of us to figure out how do we open our aperture? How do we figure out how to leverage our breath in terms of how we connect with other people that are different from us? Cause that's going to be more of the case more and more as we navigate forward. But how do we still get the cycles to build our depth of expertise, to still contribute something of substance to the team? And as we think about ourselves, we don't have to map to the perhaps the alpha archetype of what constitutes a leader in the present world's mind. Correct. You mentioned, you mentioned it. There's, like, there's gaps everywhere. We're, we're mediocre at best when you think about the solutioning across the world. Mediocre at best. But what are some of the other leadership examples? What are ways that we could serve? What are ways that we could act with conviction against the values that matter and showing up and really meaningfully serving people? And not just designing for people, not just designing with people, but including them in the journey, including them into the That's communities right. that we're a part right. of. Giving them a stake of ownership. Like we need to rewire this. And if anything, and looking at the cultural significance that the black community has brought across this planet, if if any community can start to set new paradigms and new precedents, I think it's our culture that can do that. Say that again. I think it's our culture that can do that. <laughs> and that rewiring, because you talked about rewiring, I mean, we have an opportunity to lead in the rewiring of this culture and this society based off of what we've already contributed, what we've already shown, and more importantly, what we are capable of. And so with that, you know, we always end with um, asking our cultivators like yourself, what are the three seeds that you'd want to leave Mm. with the next generation of stewards, you know, of culture moving forward? And you've dropped a ton, but if there are three seeds that you would say these are the three things I think are critical. And I might even put it in the context of the rewiring because I love how you just close that with this rewiring, which we do need to go through. Are there three seeds that you think can position us once we water, cultivate it accordingly, will get us to the place of the rewiring that's needed? I think the first one that comes to mind is it's imperative that we keep maintain and nurture an open aperture because like we have to think outside of our company walls all the time. We can't just get mired into like what the clock is saying and that we need to do or what the agenda is in the conference room. And we're sort of not realizing we're in this myopia of like, okay, this is sort of our world, our, our purview. We, we have to force ourselves to pause at those moments to open up and widen our perspective. So open the aperture because diversity breeds and enriches creativity. Give mm-hmm. give your teams more ingredients to use. That's what I mean. That's right. That's right. More open tools in the aperture. toolbox. Absolutely, and it and it it's also 
constitutes the people that you bring in to inform your team's evolution. Facts. Bring in people that are going to really push you to be better and be more equipped for what the future needs. So that's the first one. Uh, second, I think creativity needs to be nurtured like a muscle. You got to practice using your creativity. We can all be creative, but we all have to practice with it. And, and the reps. Me, <laughs> indeed. And across my polymath journey through these weird multidisciplinary leaps, um, I can, with hindsight, say that curiosity was my defining thread. And not just being curious, but leaning into the curiosity with experimentation and like doing something outside of your day-to-day, -day, having that extra conversation, doing that stretch assignment so you learn, going back to school, taking a night class, all these things help us breed evidence to find out, is this the path for us or not? Or maybe we reach that fork in the road where we need to like gutterly commit to a new path forward. You're not going to know unless you scratch that curiosity. That's right. Um, and the last one I'll say is we have to share what we learn. We have to mm -hmm. share that with others because I think it opens, it opens us up to receive more. You know, I'm, a, I'm an imperfect, uh, I'm a, I'm an imperfect man of faith. I believe I'm a cracked vessel just trying mm -hmm. to follow, you know, God's sort of imperatives for me, you know, and he's shown me so many things in my path. Uh, and I try my best to live up to the glory, right? And I, I know I fall right. short, but uh, he's shown me the more I share with faith that he's going to be there for me. Mm. Uh, it, op it opens me up to receive so much more. So mm. much more. Listen, I, I can't thank you enough for, for hitting that note um, as we open every one of these shows up um, with to whom much is given, much is required, right? And part of that is sharing. And you, my friend, are a true vessel of purpose. You are a true, perfectly imperfect reference of a work in progress, as we all are. And I'm so thankful for your humble nature. And I'm so thankful for you taking the leap to tap into the purpose that was on your spirit. And more importantly, sharing that. Sharing Thank it you. and being a reflection. You, you Job well done. You are doing an amazing amazing job man and, and i'm just so thankful so thankful well i'm thankful for you brother and you know if if i didn't say it earlier it meant something to navigate the hallways of nike's campus or the mia Hamm building and to see you and to see your smiling face or to walk into a, a jordan brand footwear design product review and see your face where you didn't shun me you mm. welcomed me mm. you you saw me Mm. That means something. So many people are not seen and mm. that, that needs to change because their differences could help everyone move forward. We have to question right. that. So thank you for seeing me, brother. I, it was my pleasure for seeing you and thank you for today, bro. We truly appreciate your support because it helps us fulfill our mission of promoting cultural awareness and personal development. Please click the subscribe button below to help ensure and solidify our mission.